in a uh, flashlight version. And I'll well, pass that around, just take a look at it. Now, I'll tell you from personal experience, if you get that dial in, it don't come off very easy. <laughs> Dave, we got a question over here. Yes. With the die, would you not be able to get more accurate than the other two methods there for a larger system if you're looking at, you could find possibly the, the, more the, leaks? The, yes. The beauty of the die is once you put it in there, it's in there. So if you have another leak to come up at a later time, you don't have to add more die to it. And that, that is a, a real plus. The downside of it is most service jobs, when you go out there, you want to try to get everything straightened out right then and there because you're looking at another service trip to go back out again. And that's where the, the, the uh, fluorescent dyes don't do well. Now, notice I said fluorescent dyes. They make dyes that aren't fluorescent. And I've never had any success with them. May, I'm sure some folks have, but my problem has been that the dye that is not fluorescent is a reddish color. And what color is copper? Not a reddish color. Uh huh. So I don't, you know, maybe it's me, but I never could see the dye. But with the fluorescent uh, dyes, I mean, it'll it'll jump out and show it to you when you hit it with that light. Uh, I heard John say something a while ago. You can't beat it. <laughs> if you put the soap on the leak detector, that's what it's called, and you see bubbles, there it is. There it is. <laughs> well, where would this not do well? Where, where, inside the world. What, what if you're inside of a coil? Okay. A lot of times, electronic leak detector will pick up leaks inside of evaporator coil that you can't visually see, <coughs> uh, but you know that it's going to be in there. You know, at that point, that's when you have to start taking panels off and, and, and uh, getting down to the nitty gritty. You're not going to be able to do that with this. It, it won't give you, like I say, you've got to be able to see it. That's the same thing with the die. You've got to be able to see it. Now, you asked a question about the die a while ago, and I, I want to add a little something to that. I used a lot of the die uh, on systems up there at uh, UGA. The bad thing about the die is I found leaps I didn't want to see. <laughs> <laughs> and it's surprising. Even the gaskets on semi-hermetics, they get a little age on them, they'll actually show up as being leaking after a period of time. It'll actually work its way through that. And the truth is that those gaskets are leaking. It's just at such a slow rate, unless you're, you're uh, getting down to the degree, it's usually not uh, feasible to replace the gaskets like that. All right. Uh, there's other types of leak detection methods out there. Another is ultrasound. I've never been successful with that. I keep telling y'all what I have not been successful with. I guess I'll quit saying that, but it's just, I, I've tried it. And the problem that I've had with the ultrasound is if I'm dealing with one system, that's not really a problem, but a lot of times in these equipment rooms, you're going to have multiple pieces of equipment running in there, and I would pick up the other sounds with the with the ultrasound. And uh, an operating system with with valves and and uh, TXDs, all sorts of controls and things such as that on it, you're going to hear sounds that look, sound like something leaking. But let, let me also say something else. Don't downplay some of the best tools that you have. That's your eyes and your ears. Okay. You go in and you look at a system, if you see an oily spot, more than likely there's a leak close by. Look at it closely. Even if you leak check it with an electronic leak detector, don't settle at that. Sometimes you may actually have to apply, and not a whole lot of heat, but just a little bit of heat around that oily spot 
in order to loosen up the oil that may be blocking the leak itself. Oil can do that. Okay. So, you know, you don't want to sit there and put a whole lot of heat on it, just enough to, to, to let the oil loosen up a little bit. Uh, I have had situations to where I'd get all sorts of crazy sounds out of le electronic. I couldn't find it with this, and I turn everything off and just listen. Listen hard. And I have found leaks that way. Like I said, it's not the most favorite thing I like to do, but it's very important. What happens on the system if it's running low on charge? Are we getting the proper cooling back to the compressor? No. Are we getting the proper oil return back? No. So you can see how critical a low charge can not only affect the efficiency of the system, but also add to the wear and tear, unnecessary wear and tear of the system too. One last thing that I didn't mention, and this has more to do with your management of the refrigerant than anything else. Electronic scales. Now I didn't bring in some of the charging cylinders that, that we've used in the past. These are much easier to use. Not only can we weigh in refrigerants, that's another lesson in itself, but we can also manage the refrigerants that we do recover. Okay? Uh, keeping track, keeping records, I don't think I can emphasize enough how important it is to keep records in the days. When you uh, recover the refrigerant, you need to write down what you recovered. If you put that refrigerant back in, make a note that you put that refrigerant back in. If you have to add refrigerant to it, then that's going to be charged. That's, that's part of the billing. And I'm sorry, but I haven't found anybody yet that can pick up something and tell me how much it weighs, especially within ounces. And uh, some of these systems only hold ounces. So I haven't found anybody that good yet. No. I always love that. Yeah, that's about five pounds right there. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. But this does. Okay. Uh, can you think of anything else that we need to recover or, or, or cover today? Uh, is, is it a practice where people will recover a fit, put it back in the system, then build the, the client okay. for... All right, there are sometimes recovery fees that companies will charge, okay? Now, I don't think that would be practical to, or not practical, but uh, ethical, to charge a person for something that belongs to them in the first place. All right, but I'm saying, you know, people will do that where they recover. Well, I had to drain the system, then I had to fill it. I'm sure, I'm sure that does happen. Right. But, uh, yeah, that's against the EPA policies, David. It is, it is. But you know, that, that is something about refrigerants now. Keep this in mind, that refrigerant belongs to the person or the owner, not the service person, okay? Not the company that's doing it. Okay, if you recover that refrigerant, you cannot take that refrigerant and go sell it to someone else. That is against the law, okay? Now, that refrigerant can go back to the owner, but not to anyone else. Let's say that the owner has a dozen air conditioning systems. It is legal, it is practical to recover refrigerant out of one system and use it in any of the owner's systems. As long as it doesn't change ownership, that's what counts. Okay. Any other questions? So if you got the refrigerant from a person's house, you'd have to take it and recycle it. Right. Legal about it. Right. Unless, unless you put it back into that system. Okay. Now. It's, it's no reason not to use the refrigerant again unless it's contaminated or unless if you're doing a change out and going with a, a, a different type system, different refrigerant, yes. Now, I will say this. Sometimes major components, if they're changed, the, the manufacturers of those components want you to use new refrigerant back in to protect their equipment. Uh, from possible damage from contaminated refrigerant that maybe not may not be caught in the field. Makes sense. Makes sense. 
they do make testers that you can ch check the refrigerant for acid, uh, water. Those those can be done in the field. You cannot. Well, you can, but I don't know anybody that would want to buy one. They they do make uh, testers that you can tell whether a refrigerant has been mixed or contaminated uh, from other refrigerants. But the last time I checked on one of those systems, it was about five thousand dollars, and I just don't see that being practical in the field. Uh, best thing to do is don't mix refrigerants. If you're going behind somebody that has, that can be a problem. No way to really tell. Uh, other than the system won't be operating anything like it should. Any other questions? I would do a uh, filter in refrigerator. Okay, we have dryers, filters. Uh, I, I don't think I have one, but they have desks in them and uh, strainers inside of them. Uh, <coughs> usually, we'll hook to a quarter-inch flare. You can do it through your hoses, through the gauges. Uh, I don't know, we haven't got to those yet. We do have one right over there on that little, see that little, let me, let me Ricky, can you? They make a recovery uh, unit. Um, this is I mean, they make a recovery recycle unit where you can recover the refrigerant and recycle it, you know, right after you recover it. We had one of those systems, but we uh, it was kind of obsolete. Uh, those are really not used that much, uh, but you could take a regular recovery unit like David showed you there and just add a filter dryer, right. and you've, ta you've taken a recovery unit and made a recycle unit out of it. I, I, I tried to make a habit when I put my refrigerant back in to run it through a little filter like this one right here. It's, it's just a small filter. It'll help remove any moisture or, uh, or solids that may be in that refrigerant. And there... I'm, you know, it, it, it cost, it's 10 or 15 dollars, but 10 or 15 dollars is a lot better than putting something in that's uh, contaminated with uh, moisture. Okay.